And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Sarah Drake, who had two near-death experiences, one in utero and one at the age of six, which we're going to learn about and more. Sarah, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I'm very excited to be here. Honored to be here. Well, we are honored to have you. And if you don't mind, let's just start with your first one and go from there. Well, the first NDE? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I do need to disclose that I did not remember this NDE because it was in utero until I was in my 40s doing uh, certain personal growth techniques. And I went into a cellular level flashback, which is the only way my analytical mind would have accepted it as being a possibility. Um, my, the first one I actually remembered was the one I was when I was six years old. Um, so to me, I don't care how I tell it in my memoir. I start with the six-year-old one because they're those two, and then what happened about a decade or so ago uh, in Peru um, when I was ready to die and chose to stay, they're all interconnected, which shows how important it is that we pay attention to what we vow because we're held to our vows. Okay. Well, but, we can, uh, you, you can, start with this? You, you can start with whatever way you feel comfortable. Okay. Well, um, I'll, st- I'll, I'll start with the, I mean, it doesn't matter how I remembered them. I'm thinking for this podcast. So I'll start with the one that happened in utero. This was back in 1956 in February. And my parents were living in West Virginia at that time in the Valley. And what they did in those days, because it was a long time ago, is they'd cut off the top of a mountain, pave it, and call it an airport. There's a little windy road going up to it, right? That's not the case now, but that's how it was then. At least that's how I remember it. They did not clean snow off the planes. They didn't de-ice the planes. They didn't clear the runway of snow or ice. They just took off and landed like they did in all weather. So my parents had gone to, I believe, Chicago, because my dad was in the furniture business. And that's where they were having... um, the biannual markets. And they were flying, but this first time my mother had ever flown. And she was about four months pregnant with me. When they were approaching the airport where they lived, mom looks out the window and goes, oh my gosh, there's snow everywhere. It turns out the pilot overshot the runway probably because he couldn't see the beginning of it. And while the plane slowed down, it didn't slow down enough. So it went over the edge of the cliff at the end of the runway and ended up about 100 yards down with its nose on a ledge, which kept it from plummeting all the way down. The fact that it had slowed enough and there was a ledge. Um. Seatbelts were pretty much the same as they are today, as I understand it. However, we did not know to when you're pregnant to put that seatbelt under the belly. So it was over my mother's belly, and she looked like she was about eight months pregnant. She was very large at that time. And so she's literally hanging, and everybody on the plane's hanging on this seat, but it was a jerk, right? over the mountain, so she kind of jerked forward and the seatbelt pulled tight against her belly. So when they finally got everybody out and up the mountain, everyone was very, very concerned for her because she was pregnant. She shared with me once that she remembers having some bleeding and getting very scared that she was gonna lose the baby. But outside of that and a couple of pictures, that's all I, in in the news article. That's all the information I really had about that experience. When I remembered it in a cellular level flashback when I was in my 40s, 
here's what I remembered. Of course, in utero, I don't know what position her body's in. It makes no difference to me. I'm in this floating sack of water or amniotic fluid. My first awareness was looking at my twin who was facing me and seeing her finger break off and float away in the amniotic fluid. And I realized she was dead. I went into um, that, that body movement when you go into like tight fetal position, but I had grabbed my umbilical cord and was choking myself with it. Now, the reason I say that is because to this day, I can't stand to have anything around my neck. It always has to be V-neck or scoop. I can wear long necklaces for a very short period of time, and then it's like I'm choking. I have to get rid of them. So what happens to us in utero can definitely impact our physical life. Are you saying that even though you have the knowledge of this, or you still have that feeling of choking? Because I was hoping... If I have anything tight. I would hope that it would go away after you have the knowledge of it. Well, but it's a cellular level memory, not an intellectual memory. Ah, makes sense. And that's what makes the difference. My cells remember that experience. Um, having the flashback reintroduce that experience. Because, I mean, let's face it, our cells, cells, depending on the organ and all that, I think it's over 14, 15 years, you have a completely new body, something like that. I don't know the exact uh, years because it does depend on what part of the body you're talking about. But obviously I still, it's it's not as intense as it was when I was young, but it does get to a point where I'm like, yeah, I got to take everything around. I, I don't buy high neck stuff, but if I'm wearing a necklace, it's like, yeah, had this for on long enough and I can't wear anything that's tight I just I can't but having the knowledge of how this originated enables me to use my intellect to address it without freaking out so um it's not really a trigger anymore because I understand it so that's where the intellect comes in um but anyway back to the experience so I'm freaking out, and there's this bright light, and my twin goes up. I can't really call it a tunnel. It was more like a ray of light from my perspective. So my twin is going up this ray of light, and I'm wanting to be with her, so I follow her too. And I get up, and she gets to go beyond a certain point, and I get to a point, and there's big light beam that's oval has sort of a shape humanoid shape within it but it's like a sh very pale shadow i felt like it was a him um i don't know why and he wouldn't let me go further he's like you got to go back and i'm like no i like it here now to me he was like 10 feet high I don't know if my perspective was that as a, a fetus, a little tiny fetus or what, but he seemed huge, very, very loving. The two things I remember is I felt like every atom was an atom of unconditional love. So it, it I experienced as just floating and being surrounded and filled with unconditional love. And he's like, you can't go further. And I'm like, no, I like it here. And I'm hearing this beautiful music, which being a researcher in one of my career incarnations, um, I like to research things. And the closest I could come to describing it, because every everything has a sound vibration to it, is it was the sounds of the realms or at least the sound of the dimension that I was on, because to me, it was like a different vibratory frequency. And um, for lack of a better description, we argued, you need to go back. No, I like it here. I'm going to stay. And finally, and it seemed my interpretation 
as an adult understanding emotions. Seemed like he was a little frustrated. I don't know if he really was. Don't even know if he's a he. But it seemed like he was kind of frustrated. And he goes, your mother asked for you. And I kind of go, oh, okay then. And I got sent back. If you think back to that time, do you think your cognitive level of thinking was like an adult or, you know, childlike or less? I don't think it can be correlated to the physical experience. Right. To be honest. Um, we have, I am a social worker. I work a lot with kids. Um, I used to be a teacher, so I, and I, I at one time wanted to be a neurologist until I found out how many years it took to get there. Um, so the brain has always fascinated me and how the brain works. The brain is still, which is cognition and emotion to a certain extent, and now we know we have three brains. So we have the head brain, which everybody knows about, but we also have a heart brain and we have a gut brain, they have different purposes. Um, and there's research being done about the heart and gut brain, just like there is about the uh, brain between our ears. Um, but essentially the processing unit for all the inputs that we experience, um, which are the senses, but also emotions are just input what we do with them that makes a difference. And our gut feelings, our input. So the brain up here processes all that, but it's still related to physical existence. Well, what I'm trying to ascertain is that at that level, you're not really thinking with your brain. You're a spiritual being at that point. It's, and I'm experiencing. Right. And so as the spiritual being, are you still as advanced as you are now well my the way i would define it now i'm getting close to 70 i've had a lot of life experiences um spiritual ones or mystical ones whatever you want to call them i've channeled um a lot a lot of different experiences and the closest i can come to describing my experience of being in that particular dimension which is, again, how I define the different vibrational frequencies of the different existences or areas, levels, whatever you want to call them. It's a beingness and a knowingness. It's not a processing mm -hmm. so much, at least not from my experience. Yeah. Now, what it's like when you're actually there and stay there, I can't tell you because I have no memory of that because I didn't stay in these memories. I was sent back both times. Let's get back to your NDE. Okay. Um, that's, that's really all there was to that first NDE that I remembered in that flashback when I was in my 40s. Well, let me ask you this before you move forward to the next one. After having the flashback, were you spiritually transformed in any way? I was traumatized, actually. In the physical body, I was traumatized by the experience. Now, what I actually experienced in terms of this physical body, I was doing this technique that in those days was called uh, rebirthing. And because of what happened in Colorado, which was not rebirthing, but they used the term, so we're not allowed to use that term. They now call it liberation breathing or something comparable. Um, it is technically, the breath is a, is technically a, um, I believe, a kundalini yoga technique. Um, but it wasn't a, learned through kundalini. It was a spontaneous learning from the people who developed this in the 60s. But, and, and continued on with, with classes and workshops. So when I remembered it, it was during a workshop where we do what's called a wet rebirth, which in this case happened to be in Ojo Caliente in New Mexico. And I was in the salt water, the um, pool, if you will. It was a cave. And it's the closest 
thing to the am in terms of chemical construction to amniotic fluid that there is on the earth. Not exactly. So I'm floating at this, got my snorkel on, right? I don't like being touched when I'm go doing one of these breathing exercises. So my partner was just kind of balancing me on the palm of his hand at my belly button area, which is like, you know, umbilical cord. And I went into the flashback. I literally, in my physical body, went into that uh, fetal position and kind of started screaming, I think. I don't know because I was living the experience. And even though the adult me was observing all this, I had no control over anything. All I could do was observe as my body remembered the experience. Found out later, it freaked my partner out. And he was trying to get help from people who have a lot of experiences. And that's why it was called rebirthing is because often people flash back to their birth experience when they're doing this type of breathing. Um, but anyway, my experience is seeing the finger float off, freaking out, doing that whole reliving the cellular level experience. And then I feel someone patting my head like this or rubbing my head. And I hear, it's okay, mama's here. It's okay, mama's here. And I remember thinking, that calmed me down immediately. I saw the rest of the vision, and then I came out of it and started getting, I literally was shaking like this. I couldn't stop for three days. And I felt very traumatized, very vulnerable. And I isolated myself somewhat so that I could process all this information. Um, what I found out later is, Nobody came and patted my head and said anything. So I experienced that from a different level of existence than the physical. Um, kind of confirms one's perspective that angels exist, maybe, right? Did you go back and verify this plane accident with your mother yes. afterwards? Yes. Well, she had already said, we had talked about it throughout my childhood and young adulthood. She had the news articles. I mean, it's part of my baby book. <laughs> and part of it that's so funny is when we moved to North Carolina and she went to um, uh, uh, what do you call them? where you get the tools and stuff like that, that kind of store to get hammers and nails. Like a not hard, Home Depot. Like a they hardware store. Hardware store. Thank you. I couldn't think of that's the chemo brain. Can't always get my words. Um, we went to a local local uh, mom and pop hardware store, and uh, she ended up meeting the owner. Turns out he was on the same plane in a different state. And in the picture, he's standing behind her from the news picture. So yay, small world. But um, that brought up the conversation again. Only once did she admit or acknowledge that she was afraid she was going to lose the baby because she had bleeding. The rest of the time, she didn't really want to talk about it ever. So other than, oh, look at the news picture. And that guy, he, he owns the hardware store down the street and, you know, stuff like that. Is it possible that your mother just rubbed her belly and said, it's okay, mama's here? Possible. It's possible. I don't know. She was highly intuitive. She ran away from that, though. She was not comfortable. Curious. My father had readings, but his family had readings by Edgar Cayce, um, actually the year the two of them met. Um, so she was very curious about that. But she did not develop or pursue she was open, just she didn't work on herself. All right. Kind of thing. So it is possible. Mm -hmm. I do not know. But it literally, when I was ex experiencing the flashback, I literally felt someone patting my head. Mm -hmm. So could be any explanation. Right. It could be my imagination. Yes. You know, who knows?
It well, calmed me down. That's all that matters. True. That's true. Well, let's move forward then to the next NDE. The next NDE was on my sixth birthday, which was a, is a summer birthday. And in the, th those days, for a period of several years, we had a college student living with us, uh, room and board, and she, um, we provided, my parents provided room and board, and she would provide babysitting services and help clean the house and stuff like that. Um, and the purpose of that, just to explain to those who are curious, is she came from a very poor family, and the only way she could go to college was to have that kind of support. And she had a scholarship to become a teacher, um, which is what she did. But uh, we were going to visit her parents who were up in the mountains. I, I lived in West Virginia in those days. And... Um, to celebrate my birthday. I absolutely loved her father. From my perspective, he was this amazing, magical person who could make quarters come out of my ears. And I'm six. Hello. I love that stuff, right? At that age. I like it now, but a little more sophisticated. But um, so to keep, she also brought my younger brother, who was two and a half at the time. They did not have seat belts or car seats or anything in 1962 that I'm aware of, or at least we didn't have them. So he's standing up in the front seat and I'm sitting in the back seat. And she kept us busy and entertained by half, because it was about, a, I'm thinking an hour to two hour drive to go up to her parents from where we lived. Um, she had us looking for cows. And so, I'm six, he's two and a half, I found them all. I, I am somewhat competitive. I've learned to turn it to personal growth for everyone, but I'm still competitive. I'm thinking he is too, or was, but I don't know. Anyway, so what I did not understand is he was getting frustrated that I'm seeing all the cows first. And he finally sees one before I do. And he got so excited, he shoots that arm out and goes, see cow, see cow. Unfortunately, it was right in front of the driver's eyes. She yanked the steering wheel in that direction. And we went down the mountain over, 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 over. The two of them were thrown out the windows. The front, at least the front windows were open. I, I again... I was told that, I don't remember it, that the front seat windows were open. And the thought is, as the car turned, I mean, a two and a half year old just slips out. And she apparently kind of slipped out too. My first memory, well, I do remember being shocked that he saw a cow before I did. And then the next thing I remember, and, and things getting all jumbly. Next thing I remember is being confused about being underneath the front seat. And I was thinking about that. Why am I under the front seat? This doesn't make sense to me. How can I be under the front seat? In that particular car, there was that much space under the front seat. So I don't think it was my body that was under there. Then everything goes black. And there's nothing until I'm hovering over a car up at the on the road up up the mountain, um, trying to figure out. I'm looking at the driver, trying to figure out why the co-ed, who was our you know part of our family really at this point, wasn't in the driver's seat. And I happen to look over to the passenger seat, and she's sitting there. So I look back at the guy and I'm like, why isn't this person in the driver's seat? And who is that man? I've never seen him before. And I start looking at the car and I'm like, whose car is this? This isn't our car. And I look at the back seat and there's a woman there holding me, my body, and my body's crying. And I'm like, who is she? Why is she holding my body? And why am I crying? Next thing I know, I'm in my body crying. So decades later, I 
got hold of the co-ed. We stayed, the family stayed in touch over the decades. And I asked her about what happened. Even though I always remembered the experience, it never occurred to me to ask, and I'll explain that in a minute. She said it was at least 30 minutes before they even knew I was down, that there was a me. Because they had already rushed my brother to the hospital. They were about to rush her. And she says, where's Sarah? Sarah? Who's Sarah? And she, I guess, she didn't give me details, but I'm guessing she explained there was another child. And they looked, got obviously got me and brought me up to the car and took me to the hospital. Um, she said that was at least 30, possibly 45 minutes long. So that was the period of time, 30 to 45 minutes, where I have no memory of anything. In the hospital, I was very, very angry, primarily because they sent me back again. And that's where I made a vow. I am never coming back here again because I have to, only because I want to, and then only to help people. That was the vow verbatim. Presumably, actually, it's so long ago, maybe I'm wrong, but that was the essence of it. And um, I remember knowing that I couldn't talk to anyone about my experience. I was told, don't talk to anyone. And that was frustrating. And from a therapist's perspective, it kind of makes sense because the way we process trauma is by talking about it whether it's through drawing pictures or doing play or as an adult, actual words. Um, so that kind of, even though I always had the memory, that kind of faded in the background. Um, I did have a regression of sorts to that particular NDE. And basically the only information that came up was I was being instructed on how to cope with the future traumas that I was going to experience as part of my soul development. And there were a lot of traumas. So, um, and I got through them and I grew and I learned. So apparently whatever that was about, it was helpful. But I did make that vow. So when I had cancer a little over 10 years ago and I had already paid for a trip, a spiritual trip to Peru. So I insisted on going on that, even though the doctors didn't want me to. But it was before my treatment started. I had uh, an experience there, which we can go into detail if you want, but uh, the short version is in that ex spiritually transforming experience, I was given permission to go ahead and die. I was shown all the people I had touched in a positive way. And then I was told, however, if you choose to stay, and then they gave me information that I don't recall. I obviously chose to stay. And as I processed a lot of this information over the 10 years, 12 years since then, it's become clear to me. You know how you get that knowing like, that's what that was about kind of thing. It was clear to me that that was to nullify the vow that I made when I was six years old. Because literally the words I said to myself was, I'll come back to make a positive difference. So that's how they're all tied up. Of course, there's a lot of other experiences um, there's a lot of trauma in there that I wouldn't wish on anyone, but I became a better person because of those traumas and how I process the information. I've had angel experiences that have been witnessed by other people as being angel experiences, which is, I'm analytical. My first master's is in statistics and research. I was a good mathematician in those days. <laughs> And uh, about the only way I would have given it validation was to have it validated in independent ways. 
why do you think you were not allowed to share the experience or talk about it? And do you feel anything for even mentioning the, the little that you did? Um, well, the logic that this adult has is that in 1962, there were state institutions. If anybody talked about these experiences, they'd end up in a state institution with everybody very unhappy. Mm, makes sense. So that's the only, well, like I said, it's logic. <laughs> that's my logical, again, I'm a social worker now, clinical social worker, so I studied a lot of what happened in these institutions. So, yeah. Now, you've also had a shared death experience. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Okay, that occurred, I was around 35, I think, 34, 35. It was after my daughter was born. I think she was at least two, but it was before I was pregnant with my son. They're four and a half years apart. In those days, um, my father's aunt, who adopted my mother, and they were very, very close, was living with my parents for her last few years of life. And um, this particular, and, and my mother would help out because I was working second shift. And my mother would help out by taking turns with my mother-in-law and having my daughter there and, and entertaining her, babysitting, all that. Well, this particular time, um, my mother had my daughter and uh, with her, and my aunt died. And I can't remember if it was a day I was working, which I'm thinking not, because I usually got off at 11, but um, I got there around two in the decision. I may have been doing errands or something. I don't I don't remember the specifics of that part. Um, I checked on my daughter to make sure she wasn't traumatized because she loved her Aunt Lil. And primarily because they were the same size at that point, just about. Um, because my Aunt Lil was a diminutive person. And I just was drawn to lie down on the bed that she died in. This was after she was in the process of being moved to the ambulance at this point and was no longer in the room. While lying on that bed, I feel myself going up, again, as if on a ray of light. I was stopped at a certain point where it was still, the light was still dull compared to this demarcation line, and it was very bright after that. But I wasn't allowed to even get up close to that separation but I was close enough to hear. And I see my aunt's experience. There's relief because she's no longer in pain. Um, she crosses over that line and all of a sudden gets very excited because she sees someone she has never, hasn't seen in since she was a little girl and was very surprised, this is what I picked up, surprised and excited, and she said the person's name, which is not a name I've ever heard, because the person was from Europe, the family I believe was from Romania, not a name I'd ever heard before, but I could pronounce it. So when I got back in my body, I went to my dad, because it was his aunt, and I said, hey, you ever heard of this person's name? And he's like, no, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I don't think that's a relative, but why don't you go check in the family book, which is like uh, uh, the Latin, what do they call it? The, um, all the connections and the history of the family and all that. So I'm flipping literally through every single page of this book, which was about that thick. And I come across that name. And then I kept flipping through to see if there was any more with, with that name. And there weren't. It was just that one time. So I take it up to my dad and I said, well, here's, here's the name right here in, in this book that you told me to look at. And uh, he looks at it and he studies it. And he goes, oh, I remember now. That was Aunt Lil's best friend when she was a little girl and she died 
Uh, I think it was the Spanish flu uh, pandemic or something like that which was my validation that I actually experienced it. So otherwise I wouldn't have believed it. I would have just, cause I'm very imaginative. I write books, hello, fiction. I would never have believed it if I hadn't had that external validation. That's amazing. Tell us about the angel experiences that other people witnessed as well. Um, the most dramatic one <clears throat> was after I was married, we were living in Tennessee. And I was a field operations supervisor for Census Bureau to do the decennial census of, I think it was 1980. No, 2000. 1980 is when I helped develop the test for them when I was the statistician still. 2000, and um, we were having what they call a blitz, which is when all the enumerators that are able to work show up in one neighborhood and we just canvass the entire neighborhood trying to get responses from people who had not yet responded. I and my two, I forget the technical term that census use, but they, they are enumerators, but they're elevated to the my assistant level. Um, um, they were helping me go through the forms that came in. And of course, that goes longer than when the, the uh, blitz itself ends and everyone goes home. We still have a lot of papers to go through. So we're sitting in Burger King, of all places. This is before they had outlawed or banned smoking in buildings but they were going that way so in this particular burger king you had the counters and then the uh eating area with the playground in front but on the side right next to the entry doors was an enclosed room except for one opening where people could go and smoke not that it prevented all the smoke from getting everywhere else but right and so we're sitting in a booth, maybe three doors down from that doorway. And out of the blue, this man. Now, we've been there for hours. There's been nobody coming in and out. And this man walks out, looks like a homeless person, had a steel rod with uh, one of the banks, one of the local banks, one of their balloons, limply i mean still had some air in it but it's limply hanging from the top of the rod he comes in like this just going census 2000 census 2000 i want to be counted by census 2000 and usually my my um, assistants would handle that and i just got internally that i was supposed to enumerate him it's only six questions so being somewhat anal retentive and very specific in, in sticking to rules. I first asked, because we're just doing the housing, people who live in houses. We weren't doing the homeless part of census yet. And I'm like, well, do you have a place to live? Because the part we're enumerating, the people we're enumerating right now have apartments or houses. He goes, oh, yes, I have an apartment down in such and such a place. I'm like, okay. Now, he looks filthy. He looks absolutely filthy. And he sits down across from me and I ask the six questions and he answers them appropriately. And then he grabs my hands. And I'm thinking, oh shit, <laughs> right? I don't know this guy. Uh, he doesn't look like he's someone I want to get close with because there's the city I leave, lived in in those days had a very high rate of crime and I'm like what's going on and then all of a sudden I feel this energy going up my arms and I'm like oh double shit I hope it's okay to swear too late now right but I'm like what is this and then all of a sudden I felt calm and I just looked at him and I listened to his words but what I heard was not what he was saying and I just felt my heart fill with love to the point of bringing 
tears to my, I didn't cry, but I had some tears because I was very grateful. I don't know. I, at that moment, I didn't understand what he was telling me, but I got that it was an angelic experience. Meanwhile, he starts cleaning up in front of my eyes and he doesn't look as dirty anymore. And when he took a breath, I went, thank you for your gift. And he throws his hands up and starts laughing. And I see sparks coming out of his eyes. And then he takes my hands again. And I just, because I'm a brat, I just go, you think I don't know what you're doing? And he laughed, more sparks. And he goes and tells me about a book by Deepak Chopra that I needed to read. Now, I'm a knee jerk because I'm a bit of a rebel. I'm a knee jerk. If it's popular, I ain't going to do it. Doesn't mean if they have something positive to give me, I'm just not going to go with the popular because to me, anything that's popular all of a sudden tends to get jaded. That's been my life experience where people become popular, they get stuck in their ego, and it distorts the message. Doesn't happen with everyone, of course, but I've seen that happen enough that I just like, I'm not going there. But they told, the this person suggested I read The Seven Laws of Spiritual Success. I think that's the name of it. By Deepak Chopra. Pulls it out of his book bag that he didn't have when he walked up. But magically appeared on the seat next to him. And he goes, here, here's what it looks like. Right? Puts it back. Totally clean. Starts walking off. The, I had two ladies next to them. One of them was like a deacon in her church or some highly elevated position. And they're both going, oh, my God, that had to have been an angel. That just had to have been an angel. And he looks over his shoulder and kind of winks at us. He goes, you know, I'm just an old drunk and laughs as he walks out of the building. So, yeah. And then I get home, and there's that book on my bookshelf. I guarantee you, I did not buy it. That's amazing. Well, how did that book change you after you read it? You know, I don't remember. I just, other than I remember that it seemed there was quite a bit of wisdom in there. It might have changed the way I pursued my personal growth process, but I don't think so per se. It certainly, though, I am sure it would have expanded my perceptions. Well, why do you think you needed to read it? I'd have to go back and read it again and look back. Oh, there's something to do. I don't think I have the book anymore, though, but I'm sure it's available. So I'd bit. have to do that to be able to answer that accurate or as accurately as possible. Because that was that was before chemo. And any what I've noticed since my chemotherapy is any memory that does not have an emotional charge to it is no longer accessible. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't think it matters. It is. And good and bad, isn't that defined as how we judge it? Yeah. So here's one of the those, is it okay to talk about the tough experiences and how the NDEs helped me process it? Sure. Allegedly, and I remembered this in a cellular level flashback when I was pregnant with my daughter. Allegedly, I was when I was three. Wouldn't wish that on anybody. Now, being the feisty brat that I was, and I'm not really brat. I'm being trying to be a little humorous here. I bit him. He was not happy. He slapped me. I literally felt all of those physical pains in my body. I don't know if he completed what he was there to do. Um, but... When I was in my teens, I, I am an empath. Uh, I Some people separate empaths into different areas, and that's one way of looking at it. Um, I hit at least half of those areas on a regular basis. 
I primarily use my empathy to help see the energy patterns that are contributing to a stuck moment in time for a person where they can't get beyond it. So it's all energy. So I look at the mental, the emotional, the, the experiential energies that are constricting the flow of energy and come up with possible solutions. It always depends on the person. Nobody fixes us, we fix ourselves, but it sometimes helps to have the information, right? So I have that ability. I have literally felt other people's pain in my body. I know things without knowing how I know that. I mean, there's it's just a whole lot in there. So um, when I was in my teens, I was going through the what I call our exploratory stupid stage of life. And we were playing with seances and Ouija boards and stuff like that. And I was typically the one energies would speak through. Now, I call them energies because there's many ways people can express after physical death. And it's not really the person as much as it is maybe their addiction or some other type of craving, which may not be alcohol or sex or drugs, et cetera, cigarettes, um, but attachments. So it seems like they're more emotional entities, if you will, but that's just based on my own personal experience. There may, I'm sure there are many other variations. This is just what I experienced. And so these would come through me and and pretend, I think, to be the person that people were trying to contact. And um, I fortunately was supported by someone who's like, yeah, you don't need to be doing this stuff. So I got out of doing it pretty quickly, which I wanted to do after some of these experiences. But... Um, it was such a difficult time in my life. And I was also very, very depressed for a lot of different reasons that were related to childhood traumas. But I didn't know that at the time. And uh, very low self-esteem, which sadly is not unusual for teenagers. And I probably would have been suicidal if that experience at the age of three hadn't happened because what I did at the age of three having been early raped is I became hypersensitive to people's energy patterns and being able to read what they kind of were thinking and to figure out am I safe or do I need to kind of fade into the woodwork and be invisible to this person so all that psychic people call, I call it intuition because psychic to me has a different connotation. All that hyper-focus was about survival until once I became an adult and started doing the processing and the workshops and the self-development, numerous things that I did to help resolve these childhood traumas. And ultimately led me to be, I hope, I'm told, helpful for others in resolving theirs. So I wouldn't wish that experience on anyone. And yet it was a gift for me. I think everybody has a lot of tough experiences in life being I here. Agree. Why do you think we come here? <laughs> I remember as a child deciding that this was hell here. That there wasn't a hell anywhere else. It, hell is here. And if you think about it and look at the world, that's an interesting perspective, maybe a little accuracy to it. Um, eventually, I came to the conclusion. Well, let me add a little info. My second brother, who's older than me, is a genius. And he read a book that was about this thick, small print that, if I remember the name correctly, it was essentially the written history of the world from the beginning of cuneiform. 
And when he read that book and I'm like, oh, that sounds like an interesting book. I'd like to read that. He's like, no, it's a very long book. It'll take a long time. I don't recommend it. And here's the bottom line. We keep repeating the same cycles over and over and over and over again. It's like we never learn. It's very depressing. Excuse me. Well, that's how he experienced it. And I'm not negating that. We all have our own perspectives. It got me to thinking, though. What history I know, and I'm not a history buff, what history I know, that perspective seems somewhat accurate. We keep repeating the same cycles. Um, I remember when my kids were teens and they're like, mom, you don't know how people are today. Kids are different. Like, yeah, we all say that when we're teenagers and we're all the same. It all boils down to the same bottom line. But that's okay. That's what teens think. And that's a normal developmental stage. But there is this repeated pattern of repetition. And there was a lot of people in the spiritual groups who are, you know, well, you remember the age of Aquarius came out. I think that was in the 70s with air. Um, all this talk about how the world's going to change and we're going to help it change. And yet, with all that desire to create change, we still are doing the same cycle, no matter, it's like beating your head against a wall sometimes. Um, so I just, I'm an observer and I was trained to be an observer, not just in my waking life and being analytical, coming up in a, growing up in an intellectual household, becoming a researcher and a statistician, so certainly educational. Um, but the spiritual experiences I'd had throughout my life also supported the perspective of observe, pay attention, look at patterns. And then there's spiritual writers, um, that had their perspectives. If you're familiar with the Waldorf school of teaching, that school is all about uh, teaching the kids to see patterns in life. So I didn't attend a Waldorf school, but that, and it was based on a, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but based on a, a German philosopher's perspective, and he actually created the first Waldorf school in Waldorf, Germany. But um, again, a lot of it is about paying attention. So I have come to, I may not be accurate, I have come to the conclusion that this physical existence is about growing and understanding ourselves as spiritual beings learning how to unconditionally love, which to me, I define that is accepting where a person is without judgment, using discernment to determine how involved, if at all, I want to be with that person. Um, I think that's what Jesus was here to teach. Because Jesus taught love. But he didn't say jump in the middle of things. He just said, in essence, be loving. Um, I haven't been able to study all teachings. There, uh, I um, was acquainted with a um, someone who was Muslim and would read the Quran every day, and he shared much of what he read with me. And it seemed what he was sharing with me anyway was also about love. Um, Buddha, if I remember correctly, taught very similar principles to what Jesus taught. Or Jesus taught the same ones as Buddha did. I forget who came first. Um, but the bottom line is uh, uh, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, even with their humanness, and some of their choices that most of us would judge as being poor choices, everybody teaches love, unconditional love. 
the ones, everyone being defined as those who seem to have a very high vibrational frequency to their existence. So I think that's what we're here to do. When I didn't want to come back, when I was fine, I was very worn out on every level, mental, emotional, physical. And I was okay. I mean, I love my kids, but I was okay with not coming back. Because to me, that's unconditional love. And then there's planet Earth. And it's kind of a no-brainer where to be, right? Planet Earth is tough. It is tough here. The message I got was, it's not about leaving here. It's about learning to bring that unconditional love and express it as fully as possible here. Now, I haven't listened to everybody's NDE. I'm actually, I mean, I've listened to a few here and there through the years, but it's not the focus of my, I've never been afraid of death. To me, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, okay? I'm a nerd. I love Lord of the Rings. In the Return of the King, when Gandalf is talking with um, Pip, I think it is, who keeps making all the mistakes and getting them in trouble, and um, the, the Hobbit says, I never thought I'd end life. On the in a battle or something like that. Never thought I'd die in a battle kind of thing. And Gandalf just says, oh, death isn't the end. It's just the beginning of a new path. And I think that kind of covers it all. Just the beginning of a new journey. But in the meantime, we do the best we can to be as kind and respectful and loving as possible. Sarah, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you up for that? And if so, how do they contact you? Okay, so yes, I am transitioning from my everyday work as a social worker, clinical social worker. Um, I'm transitioning down to part-time and I am Slowly, because there's a lot of paperwork with social work, <laughs> slowly building up my website, which is called Blue Panther Illuminations. So B-L-U-E-P-A-N-T-H-E-R-I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N-S dot com. Blue Panther Illuminations dot com. Now, again, it's still a work in progress. I also was blessed, I guess, as well, given a dream when I was pregnant with my now 34-year-old daughter of a book series that I'm in. I finished the first book. I'm probably going to publish it on uh, Kindle, the Kindle Direct Publishing. I hope by this summer I'm learning how to make my own cover for the book, the <laughs> so, it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve there on Canva. Um, so that'll be announced on the website. Um, I've also been asked by several NDE podcasters to write my memoir of the NDEs, the SDE, the STEs, the dreams, the angel experiences, et cetera. And I'm not sure how that's going to turn out, but I hope to have that done by this summer as well. But in the meantime, I am taking on what I call short-term clients if they want readings. Now, I don't read about the future. My purpose is to read energy patterns and help with information clarification so that that individual can then do what it takes to balance and clear the energy flow. I do not predict the future. As a statistician, one of the things I learned when I looked to the future, it's a probabilities game. Because one butterfly wing, using that analogy, can change everything. So there's no point in predicting the future because it's just probabilities. And unless there's a 100% probability, which FYI, there never is, it, you don't know if it's going to happen. It could be 99.9999% likely to happen. 
and it still might not. So I don't go there. To me, it makes more sense to help people clarify their own stuff. And we call it healing, but it's really a balancing of energies, allowing unimpeded flow of energy. Because that's what we are. We're all energy. So that's what the readings are about. I do have information. I find, I think I mentioned earlier, I find the brain fascinating and have studied how it works. So I have a whole section that's completely free, annotating information from across the internet and from my own studies on how the brain develops and works. And there's um, links to additional resources if you want to dig deeper kind of thing. That's an educational presentation because I think every parent needs to understand how their child's brain is developing so that they can provide support for what their child is going through, et cetera. I mean, I could go on and on, but there's a lot of information, Blue Panther Illuminations, my contact information is on that. Um, People can ask questions. If I get enough people, um, eventually I'll do a, probably a monthly Zoom. Again, needing to balance my getting paid for everything work. And, and I don't want to dump my clients, quite frankly. That's to me not ethical. Um, but working towards retirement within the next two years or so. And then doing this. So I'll be picking it up more and more and more. But I hope to have the books out. I am also creating uh, those three to five minute soundbite educational things. One of my subscription paths is only going to be five bucks. And it's uh, videos about on being human, talking about empathy, perspective, all, whatever. And people can ask for talks as well. So probably more information than you ask for. But. Well, Sarah, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Learn to love and accept yourself where you are. And if you don't like where you are, you have the skill set to create change. It's all in your own hands. Sarah, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you. You take care. Have a wonderful holiday weekend if you celebrate, even if you don't. And to all the people listening, um, find your joy in life. Look for beauty. Have fun. And don't hurt anyone, including yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.